Da 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 da. Okay, Adam, um, I think we're all ready to go. There's a few stragglers, but um, it is 11, so we'll get started. Um, yeah, cool. So, hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Build and Design Centre. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to say thank you to the boys from Modular Walls, who um, would like brochures for the company to pop over to us and have a look. Um, and we'd like to thank um, Adam from 
Um, lime trail fresco. Oh, Adam, your video has disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Joy, please, can I just ask for you to please uh, put your audio off? Oh, my God. Meet yourself, please. Um, Adam, I can't see you. I'm still here. <laughs> oh, there you are. I'm myself. <laughs> a bit of a magic trick. Okay. So we've got obviously Adam in Sydney, but we do have a live one, Mark from Lime Trail Fresco at the I'll back here, who, who will be a, around to answer any questions um, afterwards. Okay. But uh, thank you so much, Adam, and over to you. Yeah. Thanks, Sarana. This is uh, hopefully goes well. It'll be a little bit interesting. I um, I would have loved to have been there in person, uh, coming from the lockdown state, but um, unfortunately, it wasn't to be. Um, so yeah, hopefully, um, what we're going to do today, and I'll um, we'll start the presentation and run run through the agenda, but. Um, we're hoping we can help you if you've got an outdoor kitchen project in the pipeline to uh, um, eliminate any sort of mistakes, that common mistakes that we see and, and give you a few ideas um, about what to include and, and, uh, and what we've seen over the past sort of eight, nine years of, of specialising in this space. Um, so today's agenda, we'll have a little a brief chat about who we are and what we've done so far. That won't, won't take too long. Um, a bit of the evolution of the of the backyard barbecue and and where it's got to now. Um, materials and finishes, which is um, which is really important, and, and and how the business really started uh, was uh, really sourcing um, materials that would give us some designer options, um, but also withstand uh, outdoor conditions, which are obviously extreme compared to indoors. Um, so materials and finishes are quite important. Um, we'll spend a little bit of time on appliances, the, the appliances that we, uh, that we put into outdoor kitchens, uh, what's common, um, a few options, and what's, uh, what we're seeing emerging. Um, there's some new and wonderful things getting put in all the time. Um, uh, so some um, space around design. Um, sometimes working in, within smaller spaces can be a little bit harder than than actually uh, larger spaces because you're, you're trying to maximise every square centimetre of the space. So we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time on that. We'll have a look at a little bit of a case study that we did, um, which uh, the, the client had a fair bit of input in, but um, there's probably one change that we, we would have made to it um, if we had the opportunity. So that's probably a good one to, to spend maybe five minutes on. Um, We'll have a look at some rendered plans that we do with every uh, proposal that we draw up for clients. So um, when we do a quote, you're not just getting a piece of paper with a price on it. Um, we do a full set of uh, rendered plans. So we'll do a 3D drawing. Uh, we'll do an elevation with uh, dimensions and we'll do a floor plan fully dimensioned, um, which is super important, particularly if you're in the planning stage or you're building. Um, to get your services in the right location so you're not having to move them later, which can be uh, expensive and time consuming. Um, and then finally, um, installation and compliance, which is um, uh, rarely spoken about, but it's super important. Um, the uh, worst installer in the world can make the best product in the world look pretty bad. So um, we'll, we'll do a little bit around that. Uh, cool. So it's, we'll, we'll kick off. Um, oh, I should have had a, a small children warning there um, to, to protect small children before that came up. But um, a couple of years ago, we thought it might be a good idea to get bobbleheads of the team. Um, so I pretty much use my bobblehead everywhere now. And um, to be honest, I don't know how big my image is on the screen, but if you had a head like mine, you'd, you'd probably prefer a bobblehead as well. Um, a little bit about me. Um, 36 years in the building industry um, in, in, a, in a whole heap of various roles and, and different materials. Um, eight years design, build and install experience in, in outdoor kitchens um, and specialising in just outdoor kitchens. It's, it's all we do. A bit of a barbecue nuffy. Um, so I'd like to know the ins and outs, how hot they get, plate dimensions, uh, all that kind of stuff. And I'm a dad to one boy um, who's outgrown me now, which is a bit scary and a bit of a sports nut. So uh, we won't be talking football today. 
Um, the fellow in the room, um, he should, should have a prisoner number on that image. Um, he's our Queensland sales and design guru, uh, Mark Taylor. Uh, Mark's an outdoor kitchen specialist and entertainment guru, like all of us. Um, we we kind of live the job, really. We, we love being outdoors and entertaining and, and we want a nice space to do it in. And, and, and that's kind of at the heart of, heart of what we do. Um, he's the face of the team up there in Queensland at the moment and uh, he's also a dad and a, and a bit of a sports nut. Um, so they're the two of us. Um, a little bit about us and uh, as a business and where we've come from so far. Um, December 2013, the business was founded. Um, uh, currently, we're, we're currently in the, in the benchtop industry and um, outdoor kitchens were emerging. We had a few ideas that we thought would, uh, would do well. Um, so in 2014 of April, we um, uh, did our first project, completed our first project, which is the one on the right there, which was a, uh, quite a large job to undertake for our first one. Um, and we ended up spending about four or five weeks on site um, just to get that, that done. It was, uh, there was nothing square, nothing to, to, uh, to, to run off or work off. And um, it was a pretty challenging project to get first up, but um, it stood the test of time. It's still there. It's on the, on a cliff face in a, in a Melbourne Bayside suburb. So it gets full weather and it's doing really well. Um, January, 2016, we moved into a purpose-built factory. In 17, the following year, August 17, we opened our studio showroom with about five outdoor kitchens on display. In October, 2019, we passed 500 completed projects. So we're currently at about 850 completed projects um, at the moment. Um, in April this year, we opened in the sunny state of Southeast Queensland, which um, to be honest, I thought uh, I could get away up there for six months of the year. Um, but yeah, that, that kind of hasn't happened for, for obvious reasons. Um, and just recently we've developed our own, uh, our own color range for our door finishes, which we'll, uh, we'll have a bit of a look at the door finishes in a, in a few slides time. So that's pretty much who's talking to you. That's what we are. We, we're outdoor kitchen specialists. We don't pretend to be anything else or do anything else. Um, and it means we can stay on top of um, trends, on, on top of new materials um, and just what's happening in the space as a whole. Um, so the evolution of the barbecue. So I think I'm 55. So I think most people around my vintage, um, our, our parents would have had one of these little fellows up the top here, the old brick in unit out in the, out in the elements. Um, maybe not as fancy as this one with the, with the glossed up um, sort of tray there, but something similar. Um, and, and they were pretty cool. They were pretty functional. That's all we needed. Um, they kind of evolved into a barbecue being placed in, in masonry. Um, and this is where landscapers, I guess, got involved to a point where um, not only masonry, but um, internal kind of uh, treated plating and then uh, a painted exterior or a rendered exterior. Um, the, the problem with these, I guess, is that you needed access doors like this one has. Um, inside these access doors was just open. There wasn't a, a sealed cavity or an enclosed cavity. So it was just always dirty. There, there's always dirt in there or or, uh, or rain or whatever got in there. And, and it just wasn't practical storage. Um, so it served a purpose. Um, there's quite a few different shapes and sizes. And that was the domain of the landscaper, to be honest. Um, and then we've got our old mate, the trolley barbecue, which um, most people have seen um, increasingly more on landfill now um, on the side of the street wanting to be picked up. But generally made of an inferior quality stainless um, because they're a, a bit of a commodity item. Um, and, and that's kind of the journey of where, where barbecues, I guess backyard barbecues started. Um, to the evolution of what we're looking at here now. So um, old mate here had a had a, a pretty beaten up old trolley barbecue and wanted to wanted to update his space. Um, so where the evolution's happened is it's actually gone from the landscaping realm, even though landscapers are still fully involved in um, a lot of projects, our cabinet makers have started to become involved um, in the whole outdoor kitchen space. Um, and this has led to a, a kind of a few issues around the materials they use. Um, 
we hear a lot um, in, in our uh, sort of role as outdoor kitchen specialists that um, clients have been told, oh, it's undercover or, you know, it's not going to get much, it should be okay. Um, and, and it's just not right. Um, external equipment needs external materials. Um, and we probably pull out around three or four projects every month that would only be four or five years old, which is a real shame. Um, and what tends to happen is just inferior materials have been used. Um, the doors tend to lose their shape very quickly. Uh, they put pressure on the hardware, panels start to fail. Um, there's water ingress from whether it's uncovered, whether it's copping full weather, or even whether it's covered in a, and you might get a leaking downpipe or an overflow from a downpipe or any kind of sort of weather event like that or, or misadventure. And um, it can, if the, if the barbecue in the kitchen area is not made of the right stuff, it's problematic and it's gonna cause issues down the track. Um, so we've evolved to, to having a, 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 a similar looking space as our indoor kitchen in a smaller, a smaller kind of variation. Having said that, we have done projects which are a full on interior kitchen size outdoor kitchen, but um, we'll get to that because they are getting bigger and people are putting more in them. But um, uh, this one actually had a, a custom range hood built, which, um, yeah, it was, was a bit over the top, but um, that's, that's what he wanted and, and it worked out really well. So um, what we'll do, we'll, we'll flick through to, I guess, the guts of, the, of what we do, and that's the joinery. Um, so it's basically what's behind the doors, uh, the boxes, and then what you see um, on, on, on the front and, and the finishes that are available. Um, so internally, um, Basically, to look at, our carcasses are a white box, similar to an indoor kitchen. Um, the difference, or the two differences that we have, is that the cabinetry board we use, um, the PVC, um, it's a XHD, which is extra high density PVC. So the PVC board's been around for a little while. It's been used in the signage industry. Because of that, it didn't really have the structural integrity for cabinetry. So we've brought our own PVC board in. We've made it uh, a lot denser than what you can get locally. Um, so for cabinetry now, uh, it is perfect. It's spot on um, uh, to the point where we put a 25 year warranty on it. So the PVC board cannot absorb moisture. It won't rot, it won't deteriorate. You can hose the whole thing down. It can be in full weather. Um, we put the boxes together with a 316 marine grade stainless steel screw. So every cabinet that you see there has 20 316 marine grade stainless steel screws in it. So right down to the hardware that, that holds the boxes together, we've thought about it being outdoors. Um, and then on top of that, our, 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 our door frames um, or the fronts are an anodized aluminium uh, door frame. Now, the reason we use a framed door is, is simply because we've seen too many jobs with unframed doors that lose their shape really quickly outdoors. Um, so the frame's a bit of a no-brainer for us. We wanted a, a really solid frame with a low profile. So the frame we have, um, I don't know whether you can see my, my mouse pointer, but behind this insert is about 55 millimetres or two inches of aluminium. So it's quite a strong, sturdy frame. And then on the face of that is inserted, well, for seven, eight out of 10 projects, an aluminium composite panel, um, a matte aluminium composite panel finish, um, which is what we've developed a new color range in. We've got 10 new colors in that, in that range. Um, the aluminium shadow, it creates a bit of a shadow line. So it's only, you only see about one millimeter of the frame all the way around each cabinet. Um, so even though we have a really strong frame system, it's very minimal and it's, um, it's quite slim line. These frames are available in a matte black or an anodized, depending on the color you pick and the amount of, I guess, lines you like to see. Um, so we're seeing a trend at the moment where people don't want to see the lines. Um, so we're doing a black frame with dark colors. We're doing an anodized frame with lighter colors. We're having people who like the lines. Um, they, they like the definition of the, of the doors. So 
Uh, we obviously flip that on its head and reverse it. So it's all, all customizable. Um, we, we looked, um, looked very hardly or very, very hardly. I don't even know. We, we looked really hard at, um, at uh, modular early days. And to be honest, if you're not doing hundreds of one unit, there's no cost savings in going modular. Um, and most projects had some kind of custom element. So it was a no brainer to us just to uh, create the space, um, create for the space to present. So um, the three big things about the, the, light, the PVC board and, and the aluminium door frames, they're waterproof. Now, when I say they're waterproof, they're not watertight. <laughs> Excuse me. So cabinetry needs gaps to operate. So if that were to cop a, a, a heavy dose of rain in the right direction, you're going to get some residual water inside the cabinetry. You can't stop it. Um, the good thing is it's not going to damage the cabinetry um, in any way. Um, so um, anything inside, you just need to be aware of that. So what a lot of people do in in fully outdoor areas where they're completely exposed is they, uh, they keep things in plastic containers um, or something similar. If we have an outdoor kitchen that's completely exposed, we'll run a weather strip right across the top of these doors. Um, and that just stops any water coming off the bench top and running inside the cabinetry. And it, it works really, really well. Um, so all the materials we select is for, uh, for a reason. And the main reason we look at is product warranties. So, our doors and drawer fronts have a 10 year warranty on UV stability, meaning direct sun isn't going to fade them. The board has a 25 structural warranty on, uh, on uh, moisture resistance. So that's the guts of our system um, and, and it works super well. <coughs> now we've got some different options now on our Instagram. See, I better drive same. Love you. Um, uh, a couple of people have got their... Uh, uh, Medu? Uh, Lisa and Jayati. X-ray, Lejana. They need to mute themselves, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> good luck to her who was leaving there. I'm not too sure what's going on. That's good luck to you. Excuse me. All righty. So um, the most common frame door insert we have is our matte aluminium composite panel. So... Um, a matte finish, everything's handleless. We, we, we can do a handle if required, um, but everything's pushed to open and handleless by default. We can do handles and soft close if, if required. Um, so matte, matte finish, 10 colours, really smart, really sleek. Um, and what we've noticed um, lately is a, a bit of a trend in landscaping to use battens. Um, now, the problem we've seen with battens is they're extremely heavy. They're usually made of a really dense timber, like a, an iron bark or something similar, which means if, once you put a few of those on a door, that the weight is, is just super heavy and you have to use a gate hinge to actually hinge them. You've got to hinge them off a substantial post. You can't really put them into cabinetry. So we've got, a, um, we've got an alley batten product, which is a, a 38 millimeter batten, which is aluminium. Um, so it is in a timber grain colour. It looks amazing. We had it at a landscape trade show a couple of years ago uh, and not one landscape had picked it as aluminium until they tapped on it. They all thought it was timber. It's an amazing looking product. So it gives you that, um, that batten look, which is becoming really popular um, in a 38 mil batten in about four timber grain colours, some dark ones and light ones. And um, that's proving to be really popular. The other thing that's proving popular is our PVC board <clears throat> with a V-groove pattern. So I don't know whether you can, you can see that image um, all that well. I hope you can. Um, but that's basically our black frame as well, not our anodized. So you can see the anodized frame on the black panels up here stand out. And you've got the black frame on the gray panels down here. So you've got a real uh, choice of option, I suppose, on, on what, your, what your look is. The good thing about the painted PVC doors is that you can pick pretty much any colour you like. So because they're painted in an automotive paint, um, they're colour matched. So all we need is a, is a popular paint colour, whether it be Dulux or Taubman's or whatever it might be. Uh, we can paint those doors any colour they like. The PVC early days was used by cabinet makers unframed as a door and painted. <clears throat> um, terrible results. So 
as soon as it got a little bit of direct sun and a bit of heat in it, it bowed badly. And I mean, really badly. So we still frame it, um, but we uh, we can V-groove it. We can put a shaker pattern profile in there for a, a Hamptons look. Um, it is a thicker door. It's a 32 millimetre door compared to a, an 18 millimetre door for the matte panels. Um, but it gives, uh, gives us really good design options around, um, I guess, uh, uh, different aesthetics around the home. So if you've got V-groove panels on your wall, you might want to match it with V-groove doors. Um, the battens are quite earthy. Um, even the lighter colours are quite earthy and, and suit landscape areas. Um, so there are our, there are three inserts at the moment that we predominantly use with our frame system. Um, 10 year outdoor warranty on UV stability, 15 year outdoor warranty on the alley battens because they're a, uh, a five stage powder coated process. So super durable um, and 10 year warranty on the, uh, on the automotive painted PVC board. Um, now the only, only design um, limitation with the battens is uh, we need to make cabinetry certain sizes to make the gaps consistent. So in, uh, in, in some designs, it's very difficult to get those gaps right and get the cabinetry that a client wants. So um, with the battens, there might, there's a little bit, of, uh, little bit of back and forth about what your priorities are, um, but, but certainly plenty of options. And, and, and Mark can go through all that with you guys. Um, so from the door inserts, we go to the bench tops and then from the bench tops, we've pretty much got, got what we do covered from a joinery perspective. So um, we use and we have used from the very beginning of products a hell of a lot of boxes for outdoor use. So we see, and look, we, we see a number of, of people using their own bench top choices. Um, and we see a lot of concrete, we see a lot of granite, um, and we're starting to see quite a bit of porcelain. We've done a, quite a bit of porcelain ourselves. Um, the main reason we, we, we gravitate towards Corian is they have a range of colours that has a 10-year warranty on UV stability. Um, they, will, they won't fade in direct. Um, they're 100% non-porous, so they can't be permanently stained with anything. So to get a finish on, on Corian, you actually sand it. So you sand it back to a finish you require um, and it's solid all the way through. Um, it's not a laminate. So it's a solid color all the way through um, and can't be permanently stained. Joints can be achieved, um, seamless joints can be achieved. So the adhesive is a liquid form of the material with a hardener. Um, when the joints push together and you get that glue ooze out the top, you sand it back, the joint disappears. So you can make quite a large piece, might be three pieces look like one. Um, you can make waterfall ends appear seamless with no, no sign of a mitre joint or anything. So that's a real tick. It's repairable. So because it's, once again, because you've got that seamless ability, if you chip it or damage it in any way, it can be repaired. So a piece can be cut out of it, another piece can be glued into it, sanded back, and you've got a brand new bench top at the fraction of a cost of having to replace it. The other one is uh, the finishes that are starting to be developed by these guys. So they have some really nice concrete, aggregate and terrazzo finishes now. So they're purposely going out and uh, making colours for the outdoor space, which is awesome. I know... Um, I know Staron is another brand of, uh, of solid surface that um, are fairly prominent in the build and design centre, um, can also be used outdoors. It's the same product as uh, basically as Corian. They're a solid surface, which is the generic term for them. And, and they have some really, really nice terrazzo finishes as well. So um, they tick a hell of a lot of boxes for outdoor use. Um, they don't like heat. Um, however, we shield them from heat and we, we protect them well with our heat shielding, and it's, it's never been an issue. Um, we started to move away from porcelain in certain areas, uh, mainly because there's no give in it. So porcelain has no expansion or contraction whatsoever. It doesn't want to move. If it's sitting on something that wants to move, it becomes a problem. And we've seen, we've seen now maybe, I'd have to say a dozen 
uh, porcelain jobs have cracked because of it. Um, once it's cracked, it's cracked and there's no going back. It's, uh, it's a new top. So um, it, it's popular because it's extremely hard wearing, um, but you need to be mindful. If it's on a deck and there's movement, we, we, we would not uh, recommend it. Um, if it's out in the open and it's getting direct sun, so there's temperature change, uh, we wouldn't recommend it. Um, so, and, and then you've got your natural stones, your, your, your granites and your concretes. They, they're basically porous. Um, they're being a natural product, you don't know what you're getting in terms of quality. Um, they need to be sealed down the track because the sealer will break down. Um, so when you line it all up and you, and you have a look at it, um, we think Corian just stacks up really well. We've eight years now we've been using it and, and seriously have not, not had one problem. Um, so uh, that's what we recommend for our bench tops. Um, uh, having said that, we'll, we will work with other materials if, if, it's, um, if it's something that our clients want to do. Um, we just like to make them aware of the, the issues that they could face. Um, so that's pretty much the joinery and, and, and I guess the guts of what we do. Um, the, the second part, I guess, of the outdoor kitchen equation is the appliance. You can have the biggest variation on the project cost, to be honest. Um, appliances are a bit of a minefield um, and they're not all made alike. So not all barbecues are made to be built in. Um, a lot of barbecues are, uh, you know, made to be a, a consumer item that's turned over and they're not made of the right stuff. So um, we'll go through, go through a few of... Uh, few of what we've seen with appliances um, and the barbecue obviously being the heart of most jobs some we don't do a barbecue but most projects the barbecue is the the heart of the project um, so um, being the center for um, because it's built into the joinery it should be made of a high grade quality material with a an excellent warranty on the firebox and that's something that we we look for in, in a manufacturer if they put a and and the really good ones put a 10 year warranty on the firebox and they're the ones we recommend because and, and when i say firebox i mean the body of the the body of the unit um your outdoor kitchen as a joinery item is going to be there for, for, for the life of the house for, for you know, 25 years plus so the last thing you want to do is have to replace the barbecue after five years find that the model's changed and you've got a space that uh, you're finding hard to, to, to refit another model. So barbecues we recommend the manufacturers that have, have got uh, some history. They've been around for a long time. Like I say, they put a 10 year warranty on their firebox. Um, we know that internally plates and burners can be replaced and they're wearable items. The firebox is the key. Um, and then ultimately when selecting a barbecue, you're looking for different cooking styles and family size, which is going to determine the best fit for your situation. So it can be a bit of a minefield. Um, I personally would start with the, with the warranty and, and the firebox warranty and make sure you've got a good warranty on that um, and, and, then, and then move on from there. Um, uh, we'll run through, run through a couple of uh, popular barbecues that we do. Um, so... Probably the most popular one that, that, that we see is the, the Beef Eater um, Signature 3000. Um, so uh, Beef Eater have been around forever and a day. They're an Australian company. Um, even though they're, they're, their products are now made offshore, uh, their research and development is still uh, Australian. Uh, they're the hottest barbecue on the market. Uh, the burners are quite close to the grills. So if you're a, a Sierra steak guy or, or you want a hot temperature, um, beef, beef eaters, um, outstanding. Uh, the one thing that polarizes people with the beef eater brand is the window. Uh, so it's interesting. Some people find the window uh, good to see what's cooking. Other people see it as something else to clean and, and, and don't particularly like it. So, so the window tends to, to polarize people a, a fair bit. Uh, we we're pretty excited when beef eaters said they were bringing out a new model. We thought, are they going to bring one out with no window because uh, give people the option? And they brought one out with a bigger window. 
Um, but that's cool. Um, what they've done here is that they've made it a steady perspective. Um, so the 2000 series beef feeder, um, they just have a nicer front. The, 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 the drip tray here is just seamlessly integrated into the front panel. Um, so they're quite a nice barbecue as well. The window is huge. So if you've got a cleaning issue with the window, you're, you're probably not going to like this barbecue. Um, but once again, 10 year warranty on the firebox, parts are easy to get. Um, and then their service and backup is, is outstanding, which is awesome. Um, so Beef Eaters is one of, one of the really top brands that we, we like to use. Um, uh, another, another brand, um, Ziegler and Brown, um, you may have seen at Barbecues Galore. They, they are a Barbecues Galore uh, brand. Um, we have access to them and, and we, we love the barbecue. It's an awesome barbecue. Um, mainly the, the flexibility they give you. Um, so they, here they have a three burner model. They have a five burner model. You can join them together to create an eight burner barbecue. Now you, you're going to need, obviously need the space for an eight burner barbecue, but the cooking options that gives you is, is crazy. So if it's just, uh, just yourself and your partner, Oh, they've got therapies or distracted. Sorry. If it's, uh, if it's just you and the partner, then you can fire up the three burner without having to muck up this one. If you're entertaining, you've got the option of, of the bigger burner, the bigger barbecue. Um, if you're really entertaining, you've got the option of both and you can cook two things at different temperatures. You've just got so many options. They have a, they have a rotisserie that runs all the way through with both hoods open. Um, so, so plenty of options with the turbo barbecues. Um, Zugler and Brown, really, really good barbie. They've won some Australian Design Awards. They've got a different type of burner set up. Um, we won't take too long on the barbies, otherwise we'll... Uh, I'll never get off them. I um, uh, wouldn't mind having a look at Weber. Um, so Weber are an interesting, obviously an American brand. People who have cooked on a Weber swear by them, love them. Um, different style of cooking. They don't get as hot. It's a, it's a hood down slow cook. Um, this is their family Q model, which they've created now as a built-in model. Um, they do one with a black hood, which is amazing. These are a really popular little barbecue and well-priced um, for a built-in unit. Um, so we're seeing a lot of these. We're doing a lot of them. Um, the the other Weber, oh, I'm hoping everyone can see this. It's difficult not getting any feedback or seeing people. Anyway, I'll crack on. Um, the the other Weber that's really popular is the Summit, which is a freestanding unit that, that we do a lot of where we build cabinetry off to either side. Um, and we're seeing quite a bit of them there. They're a really popular model. Um, Unfortunately, you can't put a gas bottle in here for some reason. So they, we have to put the gas bottle in the cabinet. But um, the two Weber models are, are, are really cool. Um, so you're spoiled for choice. Um, another Ziegler and Brown model, again, is the Grand Turbo, um, which is another dual hood barbecue. And it's a, it's a six burner, two threes, <coughs> excuse me, with um, some rear back burners. Um, and that, that's like a metre and a half long. It's just a massive, massive barbecue. Um, so in, in, in the right circumstance and with the right size family, it's fantastic. Um, but they certainly give you plenty of options to downsize with their two burner, three burner and four burner models. Um, so it's a brief overview of, we won't go right through all, all the barbecues we do. We do have a, a put together a brochure, um, which we can email a PDF to you guys, um, of barbecues that we recommend. And there's about 25 odd barbecues in their last count um and that, that'll give you plenty of options to to have a look at so just um yeah belt the hell out of mark for that if he's if he's about there um bar fridges are probably the most second most popular item that we put into a into a uh, an outdoor kitchen so the glass door back of bar display fridge has become the default fridge for outdoor kitchens in australia but it's not going to suit every application um and the reason for that is they hate direct sun. You, you can't put them in direct sun. Um, so you're certainly not going to buy for its efficiency. They, they do take up a little bit more power than a solid door fridge. Having said that, a single door glass door fridge is going to cost maybe about $250 to run for a year. So it's not ridiculous. Um, so they're not efficient, but the aesthetic and the uh, 
he's put two in. So he's 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 obviously uh, got a problem, or he or he entertains a lot. Um, uh, so he's got a couple there um, with the backlight. He's chosen the blue backlight. There's an option of a blue or a, or a white, um, and it just create it just creates a bit of an atmosphere. It's one of those intangibles that you know it looks good or it's doing something to improve the space, but you're not quite sure what it is. Um, so we'll have a bit of a chat about what situations they work in and, and, and where a solid door would be a better option. So like I said, they, they do not like direct sun. So, and it's UV, it's not heat. So it can be a 16 degree day, which you guys don't have many of, I know, but we, we tend to find them down here and a bit lower. Um, it can be a 16 degree day and direct sun will hit that door. The temperature in the fridge will go beyond 30. It'll go north really quickly and it's UV. Um, it can be 38 degrees and in a, in a covered area and uh, it, it will work no problems at all. It can be 40, 38, 40 in a covered area, no drama. So, so the key to that is, is, is direct sun and keeping them out of direct sun. Um, because it's uh, it's problematic. Um, I'll show you. I've got an image here that I can show of a project we did with a solid door. <coughs> Excuse me. So this was a courtyard barbecue in inner city Melbourne, and we did a. Uh, she's done the black frames with a dark colour. Yeah, cool. Um, I would have advised against the dark bench top, but that's cool. Um, I probably should have actually touched on that when we when we went through bench tops. So we kind of recommend lighter colour bench tops and darker cabinetry for. For the simple reason that the darker colours tend to show more marks. They tend to show more wear. They take a lot more maintenance. It's like keeping a dark car clean compared to a light car. Um, however, if, that's said, if you want, you just need to have in your back of your mind, it's going to take a little bit more maintenance to, to, to up the sun. So bar fridge, just a little bit of a minefield. Do you want to, a good quality glass door bar fridge, it's important to keep your drinks cold, obviously. It goes without saying. Um, triple glazed is generally um, sort of our default option. Triple glazed with a heated door. And what the heated door does, it stops the condensation forming on the back of the door. So in ch cheaper models, that, that aren't, uh, not all glass door fridges are outdoor fridges. Um, and it's important to know that cheaper glass door fridges that aren't outdoor fridges they generally find that you get condensation look unfortunately um, but a, a, a very important part of the outdoor kitchen um, the less glamorous sinks and taps so a sink and taps important um, because it can make the kitchen self-contained so what I mean by that is you're not running in and out to the indoor kitchen so with a sink and tap you're cleaning up, you're washing, you're putting away. You're not going back and forward. Um, so really handy if you're going to be spending extended periods outdoors and you're not wanting to run in and out all the time. Um, stainless steel undermount is currently the most popular option. Um, a design trend we're seeing in uncovered spaces in particular is the one uh, we've got in the image there, which is a routed lid from the bench top cutout. So... You can see that that project there's uncovered again. Um, so that sink is just going to become a dirt and leaf collector. Um, what happens there is um, the the cutout that we that we do to create the hole for the sink. We polish the edge, we put a hole in it. It creates a sink lid. So when the sink's not in use, you've got extra bench top space. So really good for uh, uncovered areas. And really good for small spaces if you if you need a sink and you need that bench top space as well. The tap will swivel, so that that gooseneck tap bench top. Um, there are sinks and taps coming out made of a higher grade stainless. Um, as long as you've got a, a decent quality stainless, we find sinks and taps don't really have an issue outdoors because they're getting a regular wipe down. Um, and, and and generally how stainless um, deteriorates is is pollutants sit on it and eat into it. If it's getting a regular wipe down, um, it, it'll last forever. Um, so um, a heap of options on sinks and taps. We're seeing a trend for black. Black sinks and taps rather than chrome and stainless are, are becoming quite popular. Um, 
with the solid surface product, Corian, once again, um, you can actually create a Corian sink. So the bench top flows down seamlessly and, and creates the sink as well. Um, it's an expensive option, but it looks, it looks really smart. It looks really, really neat. Um, Alfresco range hoods, wow. They're, they're, these guys can be a real pain point. So we're gonna go through this in a little bit of detail here. Um, I've got a couple of different styles here. So we've got like a, a box canopy style powder coated black. And I've got, um, sorry, a box style, a canopy style in a, uh, in a stainless steel. Um, so a range hood is not a requirement for compliance. Um, so if you're building an outdoor kitchen, you don't have to have one. They can be extremely effective in certain situations. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, let's grab a drink. So usually where we see a range hood being used is in a, a confined space or, or a space that doesn't allow cross-flow ventilation. Um, now, due to the heat uh, produced by barbecues, which, which can be one burn on a barbecue is about four or five times the power of a burner on, a, on an indoor kitchen. Um, it requires the unit to be a semi-commercial range hood and it needs to move a minimum of 2,000 cubic metres of air per hour. So because of that, they generally have uh, two motors, um, a much better filter system than an indoor unit. So we, we have seen indoor range hoods create house fires um, for a couple of reasons. They're put down too low. Um, outdoor range hoods need to be a minimum of 1,200 off the cooking surface. So they're put down too low. They have plastic componentry and filters that just don't deal with the heat. Uh, the filters never get looked at and they can create a major problem. So um, a range is something you really need to think about quite um, carefully. Um, it can be fitted afterwards if you, if you find you've got an issue, but we strongly consider, um, it should strongly be strongly considered at the design stage um, just due to Issues retrofitting them afterwards. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in a couple of slides time around, around some design problems because this range should create quite a few of them. So we'll, we'll do that in a bit more detail. Um, other popular and emerging appliances that we're seeing put into outdoor kitchens are wooden gas-fired pizza ovens, uh, charcoal grills, ice makers, ice wells. So where people haven't got um, plumbing for a sink, an ice well is a nice option. Obviously you've got to drain it to a bucket, which isn't ideal, but uh, dishwashers, uh, beer kegs and taps, uh, actual ovens, um, induction cooktops and commercial cookware. Now, with a few of these things, we need to, we need to actually uh, give our clients a little bit of a warning. If it's a dishwasher, an oven, a cooktop, anything that's designed to be inside, your warranty is most likely going to be void. So if something goes wrong with that item and, and, and your, your local service man comes out to look at it, he's going to say, mate, it's the outdoors. Sorry, you've done the wrong thing. Your warranty doesn't apply. So it, it's a bit of a buyer beware. You've got to take on the risk um, with those items. But it's not stopping people. They're putting them out there. Um, it's just something we need to make people aware of. Uh, but in larger kitchens, we're seeing all manner of these kinds um to the point where you just it's no point going back inside to be honest um what i wanted to talk to you about appliances is a little bit uh just here within the design the design component of, of what i'm going to show you guys so um outdoor kitchen design i guess to an extent can is similar to indoor kitchens. Um, generally working in a smaller space, um, it, it can be a little bit more difficult. Um, but we also tend, because we're looking from a, an outdoor kitchen barbecue perspective, we tend to be able to see things that others can't and opportunities to uh, do other things. For instance, smaller space design critical and, and, the, and the biggest mistake we see a lot of people make is try to cram a lot of stuff into a small space and so in times like that there may be a second space that can be utilized as a as an option for a fridge take that out of the smaller design you've got a second space for the fridge where people can access it away from the barbecue and you've got a second space that doesn't look cluttered um, 
just one off the top that, that I've been thinking about. So, and this is where we get back. So common design considerations, and this is where we get back to the range hoods a little bit. So um, a few of the things we run into where, where they're retrofitted and that can be a problem are low ceiling heights where we can't get the 1200 clearance off the barbecue, box gutter drains. So in a lot of extensions, box gutter drains run internally. You can cut through them uh, and externally mount a motor or a flue. Uh, it can be fraught with a little bit of danger and you want to, you want to get someone who knows what they're doing to do that. Uh, roof trusses. If you've got a roof truss in the wrong spot and you go through the ceiling with the rain should all of a sudden where you put it may not be centered over the barbecue and it's going to look a bit average. So um, if you're in the planning stage, if you're, if you're planning to build planning your renovation and you're thinking you're going to need a rain should, yeah, um, then there's some of the things you need to really think about. Position of services, gas, water, waste, and power. Um, uh, so site dependent um, situations for existing dwellings. So what we see a lot of is uh, no access to the waste. Or, or the waste is not where we need it to be. And people either go without a sink because they can't effectively drain it, or they pay a considerable sum to get the waste moved to the right location or a pump to pump it back to the nearest location. So um, position of services in existing dwellings, obviously um, it's a little bit of a minefield depending on the site. Uh, it can be great. Everything can be in the right place. It doesn't happen that often. Um, but it's awesome when it does. Um, so early planning the key for reno and new build. So, and, and once again, this goes back to our, our 3D kind of render designs, floor plan elevation with dimensions. Um, really handy for your trade services to work off. So electrician, plumber, gas fitter, um, very easy to read. They know exactly where everything needs to be. Um, and you're not cutting through cabinets and, and, and sort of eliminating uh, usable space, which can happen. Um, and then your appliance layout for functional workflow. So um, separation of barbecue and fridge. The first, first question I ask every uh, potential client on site is how symmetrical are you in your thinking? So a lot of people, and I, I, it's probably 50-50, they want the barbecue dead centre and they want even space either side. Um, the other 50% really don't care where the barbecue sits. Uh, those people have probably have a few more design options because you can offset the barbecue and you can create zones. So um, you'll see actually in this, in this one here, the barbecue centre, you want it at dead centre. The fridge is reasonably close to the barbecue. There's a cabinet separating them there. Ideally, if you didn't mind the barbecue being offset and you put it up the left-hand end, you've kind of created a zone. You could put a sink in the middle potentially and you've, you've created a zone where people can access the fridge without getting in the way of the person cooking the barbecue. Um, so just little, little things like that. Um, sink, dishwasher, and bin locations. So if you're contemplating putting a dishwasher in, make it close to the sink, obviously, so, so we can source the same plumbing. And, and obviously a bin nearby is something to think about. Um, and then uh, the, the type of cooking you're doing in terms of a layout, um, something we actually didn't speak about was side burners, which um, I've kind of, they were quite popular maybe, I don't know, two, three years ago. They, they, they still pop up every now and then, but they're not trending. Um, where we ran into a few troubles with side burners early days was if people wanted to cook a row critical because often the handle of the rotisserie or the motor of the rotisserie, depending on the barbecue, fouled the, the side burner and you couldn't use both. Um, so if you're contemplating a side burner and you do rotisserie cooking, definitely something to think about. Um, now we, we've got a design guide checklist, which is in a PDF format, and that's available also on request. So more than happy to share that with you as well. Um, Case study. So this is a little bit of a case study. We won't spend too much time on this because there's not really a lot to talk about. But um, this project is our 18 millimetre door with a matte white ACP finish, uh, natural anodized frames, 40 millimetre Corian rain cloud bench tops, um, the Turbo Classic dual hood six burner barbecue, and a Husky two door fridge. So um, 
what they did here, they did some really nice cladding, which is quite effective. Uh, we're doing a lot more and more of this in our, in our alley batten. Um, it's becoming really, really popular, whether it's horizontal or vertical. Um, horizontal tends to collect dirt and dust and it sits on the top. Vertical, it doesn't, but it's, it's purely aesthetic and, uh, and, and what you're happy with. Um, this is the floor plan that we produced for that, for that kitchen. Um, and the one change I probably would have made with this one uh, would have been to push the barbecue. I would have eliminated that cabinet, to be honest. Uh, push the barbecue to there and open up the space between the barbecue and the fridge a bit more. But um, it, it really is uh, personal preference, but that's probably just something I would have suggested and maybe done. Um, so that's our Newport project. Um, I thought we'd give you a, an example of the rendered plans we produce. So the top left um, image is our elevation, uh, fully dimensions. Got uh, widths, cabinet widths. You've got bench top thickness. Everything's on there that, that anyone would need. Yeah. Um, and also the floor plan, um, like you saw in the other image, that floor plan there we also um, do as part of our set drawings. And this is the one where we put service locations in. So we'll put gas point here, um, power here for fridge. Um, that's an integrated bin system. So if there's a sink in here, we'll have plumbing and waste to here. Um, and we'll actually have an accurate dimension of where it needs to be. Um, so that's the 3D design we completed. And that's the actual uh, result, which was awesome. It was, it was uh, pretty close to, to what you're looking at the 3D. So for people who have trouble visualizing things, the 3D renders and plans are super, super helpful. Um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up with installation and compliance. So um, this is an installer, oh, Nigel here. Nigel has been with us since the very beginning. Um, there's not much he doesn't know about outdoor kitchens. Um, and it's really the hidden cost of a quality finish is a good installer. So I think I said before, a, a bad installer can make a really good product look terrible. And I've seen it firsthand. So we really rate the quality of installer that we uh, employ um or that we am subcontract um so they're, they're fully trained they know the indoor uh, the outdoor kitchen inside out um they're aware of compliance often the the installer will with a check measure or, or, or looking at images will pick up uh potential problems that the designer doesn't see and especially someone of nigel's experience can do that it makes a difference who builds it. And we, we, we say that all the time. It really does. We, we could have the best product in the world. If I was to install it for you, you, you wouldn't like it very much and you'd be, you'd be banging on my door for your money back. But uh, they do a magnificent job. It is the hidden cost of a quality finish um, because they do get paid well, um, but it's imperative. Um, so that's uh, a little bit of a wrap up there. Um, compliance is obviously extremely important. We're all across that. Um, thanks for listening, guys. I hope it came across okay. It's a little bit difficult without seeing you and getting any feedback, but um, I'm hoping this has worked and you've got something out of it. Obviously, if you've got any questions at all, Mark's there. I don't mind staying online for, for however long you need me. Um, and, yeah, I think that's just about on 55 minutes, guys. So I'm hoping that's okay. Thank you very much, Adam. Oh, you heard me. Yeah, yeah, they, they still, yeah. They still, yeah. I'll just, I'll show you. We should have actually been able to see you from the beginning. Um, oh, that's okay. I can't, sorry. Can, not say. <laughs> can, you take, can you take me outside so I can see some sun, please? <laughs> <laughs> With me. Oh, you poor man. Where is, where is the thing? And it's, I'll see there. Yeah, you see us. There you go. See? How are you? Hey, guys. So, uh, <laughs> so any questions while we have Adam on? Answer all the questions. You beauty. Come on. Hey. No, so it doesn't seem to be any questions, but if you guys um, would like to, if anyone would like to go up to the showroom, 
with Mark, you're most welcome to do that. And he's just kind of float around anyway. So if you have any questions that pop up, you want to have a chat to him personally, you're most welcome to do that. But thank you so much, Aaron. That was wonderful. And yeah, good luck down in Sydney. We'll see you soon. Oh, Melbourne. Oh, Melbourne. oh my God. Melbourne. Even worse. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I had a question. Oh. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you, Adam. Speak Hi, soon. Sarana. Oh, hi. I had Who's a question. Answer? Yeah, uh, it's Jyoti. Hi, Jyoti. Yeah, I was just wondering if um, Mark or Adam, if you would recommend any barbecue that helps with smoking as well, and you reckon it's a good quality one, gives 10 years warranty and things like that. Sorry, I just missed the start of that. A barbecue that does what? Sorry. Smoking as well. Helps with smoking the food. Oh. Yeah, 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 cool. So there, there, there is a, a Canadian barbecue brand called Napoleon. Um, they, they do a, a unit they call a hybrid unit, which does have a, a smoking option as well as a gas grilling option. I've got to be honest. This is a personal opinion. They're an ugly looking thing, um, but but they do the job. Um, there, there is a there is a um, an Australian made brand called Tucker Barbecues in Sydney, um, and okay. they do something they do something similar, uh, and they're they're a very very good quality. Um, I think quality was a a key word you said there because the Napoleon, even though the they've come out with something pretty funky that probably works well. Uh, their their hood construction and the overall look of it is a little bit a little bit flimsy to be honest. Um, but I'd I'd certainly I'd certainly have a look at Tucker Barbecues in um, in Sydney and see what they're doing. We're we're about to do a project where we're putting one of their charcoal grills in as well as one of their gas barbecues. I'm fairly certain they've got a hybrid unit um, that that would be that would be really good. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks a lot. No problems at all. Bye. Okay. Well, I think that's that should be it. All right. More than welcome to have a look at the display upstairs. We've yep. got and actually on the display we've got our own new pattern, so you'll obviously touch a few of those. And a couple of their different appliances as well. Perfect. Thank all you right. Very much. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. Have a good Saturday. Good Go day. to Spring Box. <laughs> Thank you.